Good morning, everybody. Once again, it's time to get started. We're going to start by going over the do now. What is the volume of 5.2 liters of propane gas at STP? So this is a problem that's related to what we were doing before we closed class last week. This is a molar volume problem. So we've got a volume. Oh, I said, what is the volume? You're probably like, what in the world am I supposed to do here? It's supposed to be how many moles? I did not catch that and I looked at this a billion times. So you probably couldn't do the problem because you're like, what in the world are we supposed to do here? That's my bad. I'll fix that for the next class. Sorry, y'all were the guinea pigs. So we're supposed to be doing volume to moles. And this is a molar volume problem. Which is only for gases. Our unit equation here. We have one molar gas is equal to 22.4 liters. When we write out our unit factors, and I'll label these, We're starting with 5.2 liters of propane. We need to choose one of these unit factors. Am I going to choose A or B if I want to convert liters to moles? So we use A and we can cancel out the liters to be left with moles. In your calculator, you're doing 5.2 divided by 22.4. When you do that, and with sig figs, you should get 0.23 moles of propane. So this is a review of molar volume from last week. Our equation, our unit equation, that's molar volume. That is the definition of molar volume. So let me know if we're good here or if there are questions.
I'm going to assume we're good here. I know it's early. But your participation is always appreciated. So we're going to finish up chapter 8 today. And then next week, you have your fourth exam. And that will be on chapters 7 and 8. We're almost done, y'all. We have a couple more chapters to go. And then the semester is over. I want to remind you of the Mastering Chemistry extra credit. It's called the Chemistry Primer. It has pra practice problems from all the different topics that we have covered and will cover in the class. It's available until about midway through finals week. Use it to help you study, make up some points for mastering chemistry. I definitely recommend doing some of the chemistry primer as much as you can. If you don't do it, it's not gonna count against you but the more you do, the more it'll help you learn and it'll help you get some points back. So if you're looking at your grade like, man, I want to change this, that's a way to do it. Mastering chemistry is worth a lot of points. It's like 40% of your grade. So if you can recover some of those points, it'll definitely help. All right. Moving on. We're still talking about gases. We talked about molar volume. And now we need to talk about density of gases. Now we talked about density in chapter two, but we focused on solids and liquids. Now we'll talk a little bit about gases. The density of a gas is much, much less than that of a liquid or a solid. And at STP, which is standard temperature and pressure we can define density as the molar mass in grams divided by the molar volume in liters remember that molar volume is equal to 22.4 liters. So what we're saying is that if I have the number of grams in my molar mass divided by the molar volume, that is the density of the gas. I'm going to show you how to use this equation. So is it okay if I move on from this slide? Okay, I'll wait. All right. What is the density of propane gas at STP? Doesn't look like we have any information here, but we do. For gases at STP, we can use the equation I introduced before. molar mass in grams over the molar volume
that's the gas density at STP. We can calculate the molar mass because we know the formula for propane. And this is a refresher for how to calculate molar mass. We've got three carbons, so that means that we need to multiply three times the atomic mass that we see on the periodic table. We've got eight hydrogens, so we take eight times the molar mass that you see on the periodic table. So that's the C3 part, that's the H8 part. When you do the math, you should get 44.094 grams for every mole of propane. Then we just set up our equation. The molar mass in grams is 44.094 grams. Molar volume is always the same, 22.4 liters. Put that in your calculator and let me know what you get. you should get 1.97 and the units here are grams per liter. Don't forget that. Questions here? Or are we ready to keep going? Let's keep going. So here's another problem type that you're going to see on the exam. I'm going to walk you through it. It's going to use the gas density concept that we just went over and bring back chapter two talking about the other definition of density. So here we've got an unknown gas. It has a mass of 2.36 grams and it occupies 1.50 liters at STP. And we need to figure out the molar mass of the gas. We know that for gases, density is equal to the molar mass divided by the molar volume. and that's only at STP. But from chapter two, we have another equation for density. Density is also equal to mass over volume. So when you have one of these unknown gas problems and you have to figure out the molar mass, you use the density equation here to figure out the density of the gas. 
that's the first step. Use density is equal to mass divided by volume to calculate the density of the gas. So let's do that. The mass we're given in the problem is 2.36 grams. The volume is 1.50 liters. When you divide, we're going to keep a lot of digits here because we're not ready yet for sig figs. This is the density of our gas. But that's not what the question is asking for. The question is asking for the molar mass. Now we have to use our other density equation molar mass divided by molar volume. And we can solve for molar mass. That's the density that we just calculated. We don't know our molar mass. I just abbreviated MM. And molar volume is always 22.4 liters. To solve this, you multiply by 22.4 liters on both sides. and that's what your molar mass is. Now you don't have to do these two steps separately. You can set one equation equal to the other and solve as well. But I like to break it up to show you just so that you understand what you're doing. Then it's totally up to you how you want to solve it. Are we ready to try a problem or do we have some questions? Then let's try one. Here you've got a mass of 1.33 grams and a volume of 6.75 liters. Go ahead and give this problem a try. I'll give you about two minutes and then I will check in. Yes, I always record the live lecture. So it will be posted sometime today. Have office hours and then I teach again. So it usually isn't posted until the evening time. Yeah, no problem. So let's get started with this one. I like to highlight my relevant information. We've got a mass, we've got a volume, we need to calculate the molar mass.
the first step is to figure out the density, right? Because we've got two equations that we can use for density. Density is always equal to mass divided by volume, whether it's a solid, liquid, or a gas. Then we've got this special case for the density of a gas at STP. You can take the molar mass of a gas divided by the molar volume and that will also give you the density. first step, we use our first equation for density. We've got 1.33 grams as our mass, 6.75 liters as our volume. So I carried a bunch of digits there because we're not ready for sig figs yet. We're just calculating the density. We haven't gotten to the very end of the problem, which is the molar mass. Now we use our special case density equation only for gases at STP, and that will help us solve for molar mass. So molar mass, I abbreviate MM. Molar volume, I abbreviate MV. That's the density that we solved for. We don't know the molar mass, that's what we're trying to figure out. Molar volume, we know that's 22.4. You multiply by 22.4 liters on both sides. That gets rid of it in the denominator And we also get rid of liters on the other side. And that's our molar mass. So let me know, how did we do with that one? I like that answer. Good. You will have a problem like this on your next exam. You'll also probably see it on the final. I ain't trying to trick nobody. As long as you know how to do this and this example is good, then you should be good to go for that question on the exam. 
So now we've got three interpretations of the mole. Last class, we talked about the number of particles, which we said could be... Oh yeah, I can go back. So the first definition we had was Avogadro's number, and that's for going from moles to particles. Particles can be ions, atoms, molecules. Then we also talked about one mole equaling the molar mass in grams. And then we talked about molar volume, one mole of gas is equal to 22.4 liters at STP. These are our three interpretations of the mole. You will need to know these. It will not be provided for you on the equation sheet. What we're gonna do now is a couple of examples of the two-step conversions that we were doing last class, only we're gonna focus on gases. So in this problem, we have to figure out how many molecules of xenon gas occupy 0.43 liters at STP. I'm drawn to the number first. I've got 0 0.430 liters. The question is asking about how many molecules. Well, that's a volume, 0 0.430 liters. And I'm trying to get to the number of molecules. So it's volume to particles. We can't jump straight there. We've actually got to do two problems, two small problems that we're going to put together in one equation. The first one is to go from volume to moles. With all of these, if you don't see moles as a given or what you need, you have to go through moles to get there. For gases, to go from volume to moles, we use molar volume. This will always be the same when you're doing volume to moles. It will be the same unit equation and the same unit factors. The second part of this problem, we need to convert the number of moles we calculate to molecules. For that, you have to use Avogadro's number. This will always be the same as well. 
the unit equation, and the unit factors. So that's a given. The hard part is figuring out which unit factor to use to get from where you are to where you want to be. For our plan, we're going from liters to moles and moles to molecules. Which unit factor am I using to go from liters to moles? We're looking at the green here. Am I using A or B? What about going from moles to molecules? We're looking at the blue. Let's make sure that our units cancel the way we want them to. We're getting rid of liters and we get to moles. That was the first part of our plan. Then we get rid of moles, we get to molecules. That was the second part of our plan. So it looks good. When you put this into your calculator, That's what you're doing. And I would recommend using parentheses to make sure that every all the operations get done in the correct order. Your calculator is going to tell you something like this. But we can only have three sig figs. So how do we feel about that? Let's keep going. Now we've got a similar question here where we've got to do 
two steps. This time, we have the mass of nitrogen gas is 3.36 liters at SCP. We need to figure this out. So we're going from the volume of a gas to the mass of a gas. Because we see that it's at STP, that means we can use molar volume. That's going to have to be our first step. The second step has to do with getting from moles to mass. Does anybody remember how we do that? We use the periodic table and we use the molar mass. Be careful when you're doing these because you don't just want to write what you see on the periodic table. You have two nitrogens here. So the molar mass is going to be two times what you see on the periodic table. With that information, I want you to try this problem. I helped you set it up some. I want you to try to get to at least setting up the equation so you can finish filling out your unit factors and then put together an equation that will get you from liters to moles and then moles to mass. I'll check in in about three minutes. Feel free to keep working if you haven't gotten to an answer yet. I'm going to fill in the unit factors here and start setting up the equation. These are our unit factors. We're starting with a volume of nitrogen gas, 3.36 liters. And we need to go from those liters 
to moles to mass in grams. For our first unit factor, we're going to choose one from the green set, volume to moles. To go from moles to mass, we're going to choose from the purple. For your calculator, you're taking 3.36, dividing it by 22.4, and then multiplying by 28.02. You should get 4.20 grams of nitrogen gas. How do we do with that one? So for those of you who aren't chiming in about how you did, maybe you didn't. That's okay. I have office hours. Maybe it'll take a little bit for it to sink in. You can do practice problems. All those things will help. But what will help even more is this cheat sheet. I'm all about cheat sheets. I like to have all my information gathered together. So I'm going to fill this out for you. I'm going to put down what you're using, whether it's Avogadro's number or molar mass. And then I'm going to show you what the unit factor looks like. So we'll have a few different colors here. So these happen in pairs because there are two unit factors for every unit equation. For the 1 series, 1A one and 1B, we're using Avogadro's number. That's to go from moles to particles or particles to moles. If you're going from moles to particles, You want the particles in the top and moles in the bottom. If you're going from particles to moles, you want to flip it. The next set, 2A and 2B, whenever you're going from moles to mass or mass to moles, you use molar mass.
you have to calculate molar mass from the periodic from the periodic table. But once you figure that out, if you're converting from moles to mass, you'll want the grams of your substance on the top and one mole on the bottom. To go from mass to moles, one mole on the top and your grams of substance on the bottom. Last but not least, we've got moles to volume and volume to moles. Only for gases. That's molar volume. To go from moles to volume, you're going to use 22.4 liters over one mole as your unit factor. If you're doing the reverse, volume to moles, you flip it. Moles on top, 22.4 liters on the bottom. I'll give you a minute if you're still trying to copy this down, but don't forget that you can always go to Blackboard to course content, find the chapter on, which is chapter 8, go to the live lecture, and I post the lecture notes. It's PDF, so you can always look back at it and copy it down in your notebook. Or, if you have access to a color printer, you can be lazy and print it out. Let me know when I can move on from this slide. I can spend maybe another 30 seconds here if needed. Okay. So now we've got to get to the other part of chapter eight, which is related because we're talking about moles, but it's a little bit different from the calculations we were doing. We're gonna start with percent composition. And hopefully you were able to watch the video. If not, I'll go over it real quick. The percent composition of a compound just lists the mass percent of each element. So if we have this example here, the we have to figure out the percent composition of methanol, we've got three elements here. We've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. If we want to figure out the percent of carbon in this molecule, what we would first do is figure out the molar mass of methanol. We've got one carbon and then we've got four hydrogens and we've got one oxygen. All of those things added together give you a molar mass of 32.042 grams per mole. To figure out the percentage of carbon, it's a part over a whole. So what part of methanol is carbon?
Well, we figured out that there's one atom of carbon in methanol. So we take that one, multiply by the molar mass of carbon, divided by the molar mass of the whole molecule. And then we multiply by 100%. What I want you to try to do is figure out the percent hydrogen and the percent oxygen. I'll give you a minute, probably two minutes. And you're going to mimic what I did if you didn't watch the video. And if you did watch the video, you might already kind of understand how this works. So in two minutes, I'll check back in, finish writing it out, and then we'll decide if we need to do another problem together or if we can move on from percent composition. So just keep that in mind. That's the goal. I'll start filling it in here. For hydrogen, we said that there were four hydrogens in methanol. We multiply that by the molar mass of hydrogen, divide by the molar mass of the whole molecule, and multiply by 100%. Same thing for oxygen. There's only one oxygen. And just so we can see the connection here, I wrote out the molar mass like that for a reason. Because it's helpful when you are doing the percent composition. So let me know. Do we need to do another example of this? Or are we ready to move on? Okay. So I will fill out this question and make sure that the answer is in the notes. But I'll leave you here just for a second if you want to do this problem on your own as practice, you can, and the answer will be in the notes. The next topic we need to talk about is the empirical formula. We're going to be figuring out the empirical formula of some substances. We got to define what that is first. The empirical formula of a compound is the simplest whole number ratio of ions in a formula unit, so that would be like an ionic compound, or atoms of each element in a molecule. But what I want to highlight is the simplest whole number ratio. It's got to be a whole number. So if you have benzene, which looks like that. The empirical formula is CH. 
a lot simpler. The ratio in benzene of carbon to hydrogen is six carbons to six hydrogens. In the molecular formula, it's one to one. That's the simplest that you can reduce that ratio down to. If we have octane, that would be eight carbons and 18 hydrogens. If you want to simplify that down, you can divide both by two. And you get the empirical formula, which is C4H9. Can't reduce it any further than that. We're going to be figuring out the empirical formulas for different compounds. When we do that, what you end up with should be a whole number and you should not be able to simplify it any further. So keep that idea in your back pocket. Now I'm going to show you an example of how to calculate an empirical formula. A 1.162 gram sample of chromium was heated with excess sulfur we have some mass of chromium sulfide that we made. What is the empirical formula? We've got a lot of information here. We need to put it all together in a way that's kind of easier to understand than a word problem. I've been I've got some chromium. And it was heated with excess sulfur. I make some kind of chromium sulfide. I don't know the empirical formula of this compound. So that means when it comes to some kind of subscripts, I don't know what they are. I use X and Y. So there could be some number there other than one. I don't know. I'm also given information about how much of my reactants. I've got 1.162 grams of chromium. It reacts with some unknown amount of sulfur. We've got a lot of it around, but only a small part of that excess sulfur reacted with the chromium. The mass of my product is 1.878 grams. We talked about this law first in chapter three, and we're bringing it up again. We also talked about it in chapter seven. It's the law of conservation of mass. And what that says is that the mass of my reactants has to equal the mass of my products. And the reason is matter is not created and it's not destroyed. So however much I start with, that's how much I finish with. To figure out how much sulfur reacted I take the amount of product that I have, 1.878, and I subtract my amount of reactant that I started with, the 1.162. When I do that, I figure out how much sulfur reacted.
now that I know this, I can continue on to actually figure out the empirical formula. So that was the first step. Figure out just how much of each reactant you have. Then we have to calculate the number of moles of each reactant. To do that, we have to use the molar mass of each of our reactants. So for chromium, we're going to take the 1.162 grams. You look at your periodic table. You figure out that chromium is 51.996 grams per mole. That's how many moles of chromium we have. We do the same thing for the sulfur. And we're not really worried about sig figs at this point. We're just trying to get a rough idea So what we know now is how many moles of each reactant we have in this compound. We've got 0 0.0223 moles of chromium, same number of moles of sulfur. The next step is calculating the mole ratio. Now it just so happens that we have the same number of moles of each. But what you would do is you would take the smallest number of moles and put that on the bottom. We'll put the sulfur on the bottom in this case. And then the bigger amount on the top. And this is only if you have two. I'll show you one with multiple. When you do that division, your calculator is just going to tell you one. But you need to be able to interpret that. That one means that you have one mole of chromium for every one mole of sulfur. And those numbers are your subscripts in your empirical formula. So our empirical formula for this case is CRS, one mole, one mole. I'll let that sink in for a second, and you let me know what you're thinking. How do we feel about this? Because this is a little different from what we've been doing. Let's do another example. Instead of getting the information about how many grams of each reactant, you might just be told 
what the percent composition is. We can still do the same calculation here, but we have to make an assumption. That assumption is this. You assume that you have 100 grams of your substance. That way, instead of percentages, you now have number of grams because your percentages add up to 100%. So instead of 92.2% carbon, we can say 92.2 grams of carbon. And we can convert that to moles just like we did before. Same thing for the hydrogen. So we figured out our moles. The next step is the mole ratio. We're going to put the smaller number of moles on the bottom. Larger amount on the top. And when you put it into your calculator, you get about one. You can look at it and see 7.68 versus 7.77. They're about the same. What that one means is that you have one mole of hydrogen for every one mole of carbon. Your empirical formula is CH. Now I promise they're not all going to be one to one and certainly they won't be on your homework. But let me know if you get the concept. I just want you to get the steps and understand what it is that we're doing. So let me know how that's going. then let's press onward. Let's try another one of these percent composition ones. Feel free to work along with me. If you're like, I got this. This is a new one that you haven't seen. Try working through it. I'm going to work through it too at the same time. And if you get stuck, you can kind of watch along and then keep going. We've got the percent composition of bismuth oxide at 89.7% bismuth, 10.3% oxygen. We've got to figure out the empirical formula. Because we've got the mass composition, which is the same thing as the percent composition, Assume that we have 100 grams of our substance. That way, instead of percentages, we can just use grams. Remember to look at your periodic table for the molar mass. We have to convert to moles.
There's our moles. If you didn't get a chance to get to the number of moles, I want you to calculate the mole ratio. Remember that you put the smaller number of moles on the bottom, the larger number on top. Smaller number on the bottom. Larger number on top. When you do the division, what do you get? You get 1.5. That's certainly not a whole number. So what does that 1.5 mean? 1.5 moles of oxygen for every one mole of bismuth. Well, we can't just write that, okay? That's wrong. 1.5 isn't a whole number. So you need to get from the 1.5 to a whole number. Now, if you multiply by 2... Then you would get 3 moles of oxygen and 2 moles of bismuth. That we can do. And that's our empirical formula. So talk to me about this one. Good. Here's one that's a bit more complicated. I want you to take a stab at it. You've got to calculate the empirical formula for 8-oxoguanine, and you've got the percent composition listed. This time, you have four elements. You're still going to do the same thing where you use the smallest number of moles to calculate the ratios. I'll give you about three minutes of a head start and then I will jump in. I'll get started on this one. As always, we're going to assume that we have 100 grams. We have to start with calculating the number of moles of each element.
So there's carbon and hydrogen. Next we'll do the nitrogen. Okay. The smallest number of moles that we have here is the oxygen. When we're doing our mole ratios, we have to figure out the ratio of carbon to oxygen, hydrogen to oxygen, and nitrogen to oxygen. We're going to put the moles of carbon in the top. and the moles of oxygen in the bottom. When that happens, the number that we get will tell us how many moles of carbon for every one mole of oxygen. And that number is 2.5. What that means is 2.5 moles of carbon for every one mole of oxygen. Now we can't leave it there because, well, that's not a whole number. So if we multiply both of those by 2, we get five moles of carbon for every two moles of oxygen. But that's not the whole story. We've still got all these other elements, the hydrogen and the nitrogen. So the next ratio we'll do is hydrogen to oxygen. Same deal. And you get the same thing about 2.5 and we do the same thing for the nitrogen And again, you get about 2.5. So for all of these,
we've got five moles of carbon for every two moles of oxygen, five moles of hydrogen for every two moles of oxygen, and five moles of nitrogen for every two moles of oxygen. What does that translate to for our empirical formula? We've got five carbons, five hydrogens, five nitrogens, and two oxygens. So that's about as complicated as it gets, where you have to figure out multiple mole ratios. Now this time we got lucky. So why are there only two oxygens? Because look at the bottom here. Oh, you see it? Okay. So we figure out all our moles. We use the smallest number of moles. You divide by small. Take all the other ones and go down the list. Figure out your mole ratio. You put it all together to make your empirical formula. Questions or are we good? So if you had two different numbers, then you'd have to figure out the lowest common denominator. So if you had a different number, like if one of them was three moles of oxygen, then you'd have to do the lowest common denominator between the two so that you could get the lowest or the simplest whole number ratio. But that'd be kind of messy. You will see problems like these on your homework and on the exam. So make sure you understand the process and how to get to the actual empirical formula. And you need to do that for two reasons. One, you're going to have questions like these. Two, we can build on this question type. We've been talking about the empirical formula. Now we've got to talk about the molecular formula. The molecular formula is some multiple of the empirical formula. So let's say that we had the empirical formula for acetylene, which we figured out was CH. Acetylene has a molar mass of 26 grams per mole. We can figure out the molecular formula. The first thing we have to do here, since we have our empirical formula already, is to calculate the molar mass of the empirical formula. Our empirical formula is CH. So you just want to add those two together, the molar mass of the carbon plus the molar mass of the hydrogen.
That's step number one. The second step is to divide the molecular formula molar mass by the molar mass of your empirical formula. The molar mass of the molecular formula is 26 grams per mole. The empirical formula we calculated that's 13.018 grams per mole and that gives us about 2. It's not exactly 2 but it's pretty close. What that means is that the molecular formula is two times your empirical formula. So if we had CH as our empirical formula, we need to multiply that by two. We have two of these. and that's our molecular formula. Questions here? The next step is to put together what we were doing with the empirical formulas with this, the molecular formula, so we can calculate the empirical and then figure out what the molecular formula is. So here's an example of that. Oh, not yet. This is just a simple molecular formula one. Then we'll get to that. Do you guys want to try this one? Okay. Then I'll let you go for it. You have the compound lysine, which is an amino acid, and the chemical formula for it, the molecular formula, and, or that's the empirical formula, and you have the molar mass of the molecular formula. You need to figure out the molecular formula. I'll give you about three minutes to do that. So here we go. First thing you have to do is calculate the molar mass of the empirical formula. We've got three carbons, we've got seven nitrogens, we've got one nitrogen,
and one oxygen. When you add all that up together, you get 73.093 grams per mole, so about 73. Then you take the molar mass of the molecular formula Divide that by the molar mass of the empirical formula. It's about 73 grams. So that's what we'll put there. And that equals 2. That's our empirical formula. We need to multiply that by 2. C6, H14, N2, O2. That's our molecular formula. So if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to move on from this so that we can put these two concepts together. Okay. Now we've got a percent composition going all the way to finding the molecular formula. A compound contains 8.81 grams of carbon, 91.2 grams of chlorine. If the molar mass of the compound is 1,362.5, what is the molecular formula? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a couple of minutes and convert the grams of carbon and the grams of chlorine to moles. Figure out your empirical formula. If you feel comfortable, you can then figure out the molar mass of the empirical formula and do what we just did to figure out the molecular formula but I'll write out the steps of what you need to do. I want you to get as far as you can in the next three minutes. I'm still kind of going to be writing things out, but try to work on your own. The first step, convert grams to moles. Then you find your mole ratio for the empirical formula. Calculate the molar mass of your empirical formula. And then you determine your molecular formula. So that's the plan that you need to work through. I'm going to work through it too at the same time.
So if you got a little bit stuck on step one, you have your moles. You can try for that mole ratio where you divide by small. Divide by the smallest number of moles. Remember that when you don't have a whole number, you need to make it a whole number. We can't leave it like that. The easiest thing to start with is just try multiplying by 2. There's our empirical formula, C2Cl7. Now if you couldn't get there, I know you can do the molar mass. So figure out the molar mass of our empirical formula. So there's that molar mass. Remember for the molecular formula, we're taking the molar mass of the molecular formula. And dividing by the empirical formula molar mass. This tells us how many times we're multiplying by. So 
So we're taking this C2Cl7 and multiplying it by 5. And that's our molar or molecular formula. So how do we do there? I'm color coding here so that you can kind of track it if you need to look back at it. Y'all know I like the colors. It would not be complete without colors everywhere. This is as complicated as it gets. You have a percent composition. You figure out the empirical formula. Then you determine the molecular formula. Here's another one that I want you to try. I want you to start it. I'll give you about five minutes and then I will fill it in. If you get stuck, let me know. I'm gonna get started here by just writing up the moles and everything like that. So you can keep working if you haven't gotten to an answer. Three minutes isn't a very long time. So you still have another couple of minutes while I start writing things. The first step, we're going to take all these percentages and convert to moles. We're going to divide by small, which the carbon and the oxygen have the same um, number of moles. So we'll just start here. We'll use the carbon. The first mole ratio will do is hydrogen to carbon. And when you have more than one element like we do here and some of the other examples we've done, I highly recommend writing out which mole ratio you're doing. So I said hydrogen to carbon. So that means that I'm writing hydrogen on the top 
and carbon on the bottom. This will help you keep track. We get two here, which means two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of carbon. Now we can do oxygen to carbon, which you probably don't really need to write out. But for completion's sake, that's what we're going to do. The ratio here is 1, which means 1 mole of oxygen for every 1 mole of carbon. Our empirical formula is C. H2O. We need to find the molar mass of that. When you add all that up, it's about 30 grams. Then we take the molar mass of the molecular formula Divide that by the molar mass of the empirical formula. The molar mass in the problem is 90 grams per mole. We calculated about 30 grams per mole for our empirical formula. So that means we have to take our empirical formula and multiply it by 3. And that's our molecular formula. C3H6O3. How did we do with this one? Good. So if you're like, all right, I got this, then you're in great shape for the exam next week. As usual, I'll post an exam review. And since we're talking about reminders, let me go to the reminder slide because we're done after this. Chapter 8 Mastering Chemistry Assignments are due this Sunday, April 4th. Hopefully you had a chance to kind of get started on them. If you did not hand in your chapter check-in for Chapter 8, you still can. You're going to lose some points, but you can still turn it in up until Sunday, April 4th at 11.59 p.m. 
So if you forgot, didn't have time, whatever, you can still just slide that on in. Don't need to email me about it. Don't need to send me a course message. Just do it. Upload it to Blackboard. Exam four is next week. It's going to cover chapters seven and eight. I'll post the exam review and we'll do a similar thing to how we did with chapter two. So for exam four, you can type out your work. for the math problems. And if you do that, I'll look at your work and assess partial credit. So just type it out in the, um, you know, in the short response box and I will look at your work. For some things like balancing equations, you can't really type that out it's either going to be it's right or it's wrong. But for the math problems that we were doing in chapter 8, you can definitely put, you know, what your equation is, your final equation for figuring out, you know, converting volume of gas to grams of gas or something like that. And you can write out kind of your steps for these problems where it's like, okay, these are the moles that I got for each element. Here's my empirical formula. Here's the molar mass of my empirical formula. Here's what I got. So we'll go more into detail about that with the types of things that I'll be looking for to assess partial credit for those types of questions next week. Next week, we're going to do exam review as usual. And we're going to be starting chapter 9. And ch chapter 9 is on stoichiometry. So we're going to be using all of the things that we talked about here with the mole and applying it to doing calculations with chemical reactions. So you'll definitely need to have your chapter eight freshly on deck for chapter nine. I know you probably won't have a chance to look at the video for chapter nine. I'll still try to get it done and posted so that you can if you have time. But for the first part of chapter nine, we're going to kind of treat it like you haven't really had a chance to, and we're going to be learning it for the first time. So I just want to take that stress out of the way. I have office hours today. They start at 1130. If you have questions about homework, if you need some help with preparing for the exam, you have some study issues you want to ask, like how to study, you can always log on and ask those questions too, or just use course messages. That's all I have for you. If you have any questions for me, this is a good time. Otherwise, you're free to go.